The paper offers a PubMed-based systematic literature review and meta-analysis that examines outcomes associated with mandibular distraction in the pediatric population. I think this review, like other recent reviews of distraction osteogenesis, offers an opportunity to critically assess the effectiveness of the technique of distraction osteogenesis now in use for at least 20 years at numerous centers around the world. Let me first address the methods employed in this manuscript. This was a comprehensive PubMed-based literature review that included English language articles from 1992 to 2013. Only pediatric patients under 18 years of age with documented airway obstruction treated with mandibular distraction were included in the study. And specifically, airway obstruction was defined as having obstructive sleep apnea identified by polysomnography or being dependent on a supplemental airway such as tracheostomy or a nasopharyngeal airway. Ultimately, after following a variety of inclusion and exclusion criteria, the review included 74 studies and a total of 711 patients. Several variables were compiled, which addressed patient demographics, distraction methods, outcomes of therapy, and associated complications. In somewhat broad strokes, the results of the study were the following. One, demographically, the vast majority of mandibular distractions were performed to treat non-syndromic Pierre Robin sequence. The remainder was performed in a variety of syndromic conditions and specific anatomic abnormalities. The mean reported follow-up was 2.4 years. Second, the authors noted that distraction protocols varied greatly with significant variability in latency period, distraction distance, the duration of consolidation, and the type of device employed. Three, the rate of complications approached 24%, not surprisingly, infections were the most common. And four, the, auth the authors noted that distraction was successful in treating airway obstruction in 90% of patients. In particular, they note that 84% of previously tracheostomy-dependent patients were successfully decannulated. Furthermore, in patients with documented obstructive sleep apnea, the success rate of mandibular distraction approached 96%. Taken in aggregate, the message of this paper is that in the pediatric population, mandibular distraction osteogenesis is highly effective in the treatment of upper airway obstruction in a wide variety of patients. The authors should be commended in their appraisal of this varied literature. Finally, the critiques I would offer are the following. First, while this review is systematic in its methods of article selection and data analysis, the levels of evidence provided by each of the included articles is not explicitly described. Previous systematic reviews performed by Bookman et al. from Cincinnati Children's Hospital have documented the generally low level of evidence provided by most studies which address infants with tongue-based upper airway obstruction. The vast majority are case series or level four. It would be useful if the authors specified the various levels of evidence included in this meta-analysis. Furthermore, it is important to critically assess the author's criteria for success of distraction in this varied population. An examination of the criteria for success of distraction in Table 1, we find that many of the criteria are either somewhat vague, such as an improvement in the obstructive apnea hypopnea index, or rather small in their magnitude, such as an improvement in O2 saturation of greater than 5%. As such, this article may overestimate the effectiveness of distraction in general. Nonetheless, I think this is a valuable contribution to the growing literature documenting our experience with uh, mandibular distraction in the pedi pediatric population, and the authors from McGill and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia should be commended for their efforts. Thank you for your time.